I'm going to read from 2 Peter chapter 3. And I started uh, this little mini-series a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it's really important when you're doing something to have it consecutive. And because we, we, there's been a, a week intervening, it, it's been difficult even for myself to get back and, and get things in the kilter. And I, I hope I've been able to do that with you. I hope it won't be too much of a disadvantage. I'm going to read... Uh, from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, and I'm, I'm going to read until the end of verse 7, not to verse 9. Last time we looked at this, we looked at verses 1 and 2, but I'm beginning to read now at verse 3. Peter writes, First of all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, Where is this coming, he promised, Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, uh, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Father in heaven, we ask that the Spirit of God may be very active among us as we begin to hold up your word and to seek to proclaim the truth of the word of God. And we ask, O oh God, that you would open our minds and our hearts and that you would open our wills so that what we hear this morning may not simply be forgotten a quarter after midday, God help us, we pray, in the name and for the glory of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. This particular chapter introduces us to, in actual fact, individuals um, who are the reason the very letter was written. People uh, in positions of leadership, as it happens, who were confusing the churches with false teaching. And... Uh, I didn't look at chapter 2 before coming to chapter 3, but chapter 2 gave quite an introduction uh, to uh, these men, quite an introduction and something, I think, of an overview of the people we're looking at a little bit more closely in chapter 3. But chapter 3, verses uh, 3 to 7, give us quite a description of these people. And uh, I was attracted to this letter and this, you know, this particular chapter in particular, it seems odd to take just one chapter out of a letter, but uh, it, it so fascinated me and so captured my own mind and interest that that's how this little mini-series began. And I'll tell you why, because I find it just as timely today as, as it was more than 20 centuries ago. I mean, I, I, I'm thinking about the people to whom Peter wrote and, and what their thoughts and minds were at that time. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that the similarities between the first century and the 21st century are pretty similar. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the scoffer of the first century is remarkably similar to the scoffer of the 21st century. And if you paid attention to the last time, as Peter urged the Christians, as he did, to remember, stimulate their minds, to stimulate their minds to recall the words of the prophets and the apostles. And I mentioned last week, when he talks about the prophets and the apostles, he's talking about nothing other than the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. And his reason being for encouraging us to stimulate our minds and recall the words of the Old and New Testaments was simple, simple, because those scriptures those scriptures would keep the people's knowledge uh, of God clear and correct. And, and we're losing that today. I, I know you'll think, oh man, the pastors, or the pastors being a pastor this morning. That's the first time I've ever heard that, Kelly. And I, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm not enamored by it. <laughs> 
But the scriptures of Old and New Testament are going to be the very things that are going to keep our knowledge of God clear and correct. And, and the average person does not have that clarity and correctness today. Not even in churches, I fear. Yet, Peter makes it very plain that as we listen to the scriptures, whether it be in the first century or the 21st century, there are other voices around us. And, and that's the challenge. In fact, that's the problem. There are other voices around us. And they're voices that speak very loudly so as to interfere with our hearing of the Scriptures. And uh, it's, 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 it's not an overstatement to say that these other voices seek to drown out the witness of Scripture completely. And, and so what Peter's doing in, in these verses He's contrasting the words of verses 1 and 2, his words to the Christians, with the words of the scoffers in verse 3. And it's pretty obvious that he's concerned that the scoffers are actually winning. People were listening to these teachers because they were contemporary because they lived at the same time as the people Peter was writing to. And their words, the things that they were saying, were in vogue with the time. And they were in vogue with the culture that they lived in. And unlike the apostles and the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, these teachers were actually in front of their eyes. And that's a big disadvantage that we have today because we didn't know Moses. We didn't know the minor prophets. I've never met Peter or Paul or James or John or Mark or Luke. They've been long time gone. And this is a battle that's been ramped up and raging I'm not saying it's been confined to this period, but it's been ramped up and raging in the last part of the 20th century, and it's actually in the ascendancy today. Now, I have prayed that God would open our minds and our hearts and our wills to the Word of God, because I know that there are people even in this little group, and you will not remember this, you may not even be concentrating and listening properly. But the challenge is, are the churches to listen to the scriptures that were written so long ago by the apostles and by uh, the prophets, or are we listening to the contemporary voices which actually scoff at those scriptures? And you may think, man, the pastor's a real pest. Imagine, would he, would he intimate in any way that this could be true? I'm telling you, that's the challenge of the 21st century, and particularly so where we live. Now, I'm not expecting you're going to hear these things too often from too many people. But I've been doing this for 40 years, and my only concern from the very first day was to take God's Word and to teach God's Word and to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ. I have no other interest. It still bothers me today that I may be wavering in some way, but my desire is that I should be true to God's Word. I have no authority of my own. My only authority comes from God's Word. And woe betide me if I do not be responsible and faithful in that teaching. And so looking at verse 3, the word Peter uses to describe those who were confusing the churches in his day was the scoffer. Now, that's, that's still a word that's very much in use today, and I don't think I need to define it too clearly, but the scoffer laughs at the old truths. I'm talking about the scoffer here in, in, in 2 Peter chapter 3. The scoffer laughs at the old truths. The scoffer is contemptuous of doctrine. The scoffer teases the church people about their dependence on things that are written so long ago by people who have been dead for such a long time. And the scoffer makes a laughing stock 
of historic Christianity. And we may be helping them, perhaps. And the scoffer's weapons are sarcasm and irreverence. And uh, I'm not sure just how attuned you are into these two things, but those are weapons which Christians have always found intimidating. Sarcasm directed at you is very hard to deal with. And uh, irreverence is something that is all around us. And when we are in a reverend company, it is, it's amazing how reluctant we are to rebuke that or to stand against it. Now, you'll find the scoffer in academia today. That's a, a favorite place for the scoffer. And believe it or not, and I hate to say this, but you'll find the scoffer in seminaries today. Not all seminaries but a sizable number of seminaries. And you'll find the scoffer in the Congress. You'll find him and her up in Sacramento, and you'll find them in Washington, D.C. And you'll find, in actual fact, that much of the media, not all of it, but much of the media, is run by scoffers much of the time. Now, thanks be to God, you will not yet find the scoffer to the same degree in the churches, because even today in the 21st century, even in California, average churches still aren't welcoming to scoffers. I hope not. But nonetheless, their influence is pervasive. And you'll notice Peter notes three characteristics of these people. And from the get-go, I want you to know that I'm not going to be able to do all three because I want to say so much about each characteristic. He tells us in verse 3 what they follow, what drives them. He tells us in verse 4 what they say. And then he tells us in verses 5 to 7 what they ignore. And these things are vital. Now, first in verse 3, Peter tells us what the scoffers f follow. He tells us what drives them. And he tells us quite plainly, it is their own evil desires. Now, let, let me just tease that out a little bit. What he means is simply this, the things that they have a passion for, what they feel and what they believe within, and what they want to see and how they want their world to be. Now, that's their first problem, because what's in their hearts and minds isn't what people need to hear. People like you and people like me and others outside who never go to church, they're never going to hear the voices that you are hearing Poor souls. They share what they think and what they think should be believed. And the God's honest truth is someone who has to listen to scoffers, what they have to say it can be very interesting. It can, actually, it's very intriguing. I had a wonderful opportunity last week to go to a luncheon where 117 churches were represented by their ministers. And it was absolutely remarkable. And up on the screen, we had pictures of those 117 churches. And it was remarkable to see that and to have us all gathered. And I was one of only two Southern Baptists who responded to the opportunity to be there. And what I heard was interesting and intriguing. And there were all kinds of people, and some of them, quite honestly, came from very strange places. And they had some very strange eye. Ideas. But listen, it's not things that are interesting and intriguing that we need to be hearing. That's not what a teacher should be teaching. What a Christian teacher should be doing is stimulating our sincere minds to recall the words of the prophets and the apostles. 
In other words, the teacher's responsibility, my responsibility, each and every Sunday school teacher here, anyone who teaches our children or our youth, the responsibility is to look beyond his or her knowledge and the authority, their authority, to the external knowledge and authority of the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. And that's what they need to teach. And God forbid, but that's what they need to teach exclusively. Brothers and sisters, I am concerned. You know, I do feel like a pest when I get into this kind of mode. I'm a very jovial, genial kind of character, but you know there are things that have to be said. And they have to be said in a world where there's so much smoke and mirrors, and where so much smoke and mirrors that's invading the churches. My job as Jesus under shepherd, listen to me, isn't to look into my heart. It's not to look into my mind and tell you what I think or what I feel should be. It's to look into the Bible and to tell you what it says. And Peter's point is crucial. What's the authority Christian teachers should be teaching? I'll tell you in a word or a sentence. It's the scripture delivered in the past by the prophets and the uh, apostles. Now, do you think that's the case? Or do you think that we should be listening to the contemporary thoughts and feelings espoused by people today? Because all you have to do is set up a contrast. And you don't need to go very far or dig very deeply to see that contrast. And let me show you how important this is. Just to show you how important it is to take the word of the prophets and the apostles. If you turn back to chapter 1 at verse 16, what Peter is doing here, he's looking back to the day when he witnessed the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus. And if you think about that, it's, it's recorded in Mark chapter 9, but if you think about that, it must have been an absolutely awesome experience. There is the Lord Jesus transfigured in his heavenly glory before Peter and two other disciples. And then there appears Moses and Elijah with the Lord Jesus. And in verse 17, Peter tells us that on that day, that on that day of the transfiguration, that God spoke from heaven. Now, the reason that God spoke from heaven was so that Peter and the others with him, the two others, might understand what they were seeing. Now, I know that to be the case because it's obvious Peter and his fellow apostles were overawed. They were absolutely... <sighs> maxed out by the majesty of Jesus. And so the voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. Now that's really important because now we know what the transfiguration was about. It was the affirmation by God that Jesus was the Messiah and that he was God's son. But at the time, it was very different. Don't you remember? If you look back on Mark chapter 9, where Jesus is transfigured and Mark records it, and remember, Peter is the apostle behind Mark's gospel, and there's Jesus transfigured, and he's talking to Elijah and Moses, and Peter said to Jesus in verse 5, Jesus, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And Mark notes that Peter said this because he was frightened and he didn't know what else to say. And so it was his, his sincere and his honest desire to put up three shelters. It, it was his sincere desire. Yet he was sincerely dead wrong. You see, the language of Peter in verse 5, and please don't get all upset about this, 
I mean it, it's true, I can verify it. Peter's language in verse 5 is the language, and I'm talking about verse 5 in Mark 9, it's the language of the NEA, the National Education Authority, and the ACLU, as they put out their religious education syllabus and equality of doctrines, because they don't want any particular figure to be left out. Worse still, they don't want one in particular to be elevated above the others. So they lump them all together in equality, and they honor them all. Just like Peter wanted to do, build three shelters, one for you, Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And you see, they cannot let the Christian church proselytize people of other faiths or none. And they do that by saying that, Christians saying that one of the world's religious figures <laughs> isn't the same as the rest. He's Lord of them all. That is the Christian gospel. That is God's revealed truth. I know that it's going to get you into trouble. God knows it gets me into trouble just about every other day. We can't do that. We can't say that Jesus is Lord. We can't say that the way to God is uh, through Jesus Christ, that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one can come to the Father except... You can't do it because it's exclusive. And it's intolerant, and it's bigoted, and it causes great tension in society. And so I say to you today, I mean, I'm sure you realize this, but it's the dominant culture desire not to elevate any one particular religious figure of faith. But it's a mistake. Worse than that, it's wrong. And of course, don't get me wrong, please. It's not wrong to respect the religious feelings of others. Over the years, I've had much opportunity to meet with people from an Islamic religion, others who were Buddhists, others from all kinds of religious faiths, and I've never yet set out to be rude or demeaning to them. We respect them. But if we want the truth, we have got to go to the Holy Scriptures. And both the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament tell us that Jesus is Lord or he is nothing. Jesus is Lord or he is nothing. So you see, a sincere desire can be sincerely wrong and lead us astray. Now, I'm glad you're all sitting down. And you might have to put your hard hat on for the next few minutes. How true this is of the church today. Feelings of compassion and humility often lead our church leaders to neglect their responsibility to say the things that are now unpopular in our culture. In other words, to say what may be in their hearts, but which is not written in the scriptures. And especially so when we are people who are sinful, when we have a fallen nature and we're always under pressure to do wrong. And that's the pressure in our society today on individual Christians and all the more so in their leaders. Just look back at the second chapter at verse 15 where the false teachers, Peter tells us, they were drawn away from the straight and narrow by their desire for material things. It was a greed inside of themselves where they saw their position where they could better themselves materially. And we see this temptation that even Christians are under and leaders especially. So perhaps you don't realize this. Because of the allure of material, leaders of churches wanting to go from this church to that church to the other church because they pay more money, because they can have more stuff, or the allure of popularity. People will say things that will make them popular, that will help them to be accepted. 
or will give them prestige. You know, there's nothing like climbing up the ladder, even the ecclesiastical ladder. Oh, I know you're immune from these thoughts. And what about advancement in our academic disciplines? It's amazing how we can curtail our, our, our basic core views so that we don't harm our academic aspiration. We're willing to downgrade and we're willing to revise the teaching of Scripture. <clears throat> now, this is why I told you that I'm glad you're sitting down. You see these desires... They were in the hearts of the teachers. And the result of that was it fashioned what came out of their mouths. What was fashioned in their heart dictated what came out of their mouths. Now, I remember a story. I'll actually be reading it in the next few days because I'm in the book of Numbers. And in the Old Testament... The prophet Balaam knew exactly what he should have said. But there was money on the table. And there was the opportunity to be approved and gain some prestige. And so he said, what would get him both things? Now you must be blind or deaf or both if you haven't witnessed the trend among people generally and sadly among some who have positions of responsibility in churches. Now, I don't mean to be rude. I don't want to hurt anybody. And I certainly don't want to be offensive without cause. I'm thinking about people who now say marriage between persons of the same sex, practicing homosexuals in ministry, Taking the life of an unborn child at any period of gest gest uh, gestation is not morally taboo. They will tell me it's a human and it's a civil right. Let me say this because I'm not a hard person. If a person of one gender wants to marry a person of another gender, that's all right with me. They take responsibility for it. I'm not going to condone them. I'm not going to encourage them. But that's their responsibility. And they have a right to do that in the society in which we live. And I'm not going to impugn them. Or if a man of one sex wants to have active sexual relations with a, a, a person of the same sex, let me tell you, there are enough of people like that out there. And I'll tell you what, th that's up to them. And they, they can do that. They have the individual right to do that. And I am not going to interfere with it, but I'm not going to condone it, and I'm not going to support it. And I have to say, why not? I know it's common, I know it's legal, I know it's part of our culture today, but let me tell you something. No one ever found that in the scriptures because the prophets and the apostles are unequivocal in what they say and no church leader can mistake it. But they go with it, these people. And they teach it because their desire is to be accepted and in the case of some, because they themselves have that kind of, of sexual desire. You know, we as Southern Baptists have enough to contend with in our own group of churches. But there are some churches where men and women have gone into ministry so that they could take advantage of other people. First, Peter tells us what drives these false teachers. And what drives them, listen to me, Peter tells us, is their own evil desires. They teach it not because it's in the Scriptures, but because it's in their hearts. Because it's in their hearts. Now, I'm putting this before you. A very important contrast is available in teaching 
culturally and even in churches today. Simple. Teaching that comes from God or teaching that comes from man. And that's a choice and a contrast that we have to make our minds up on. Now, I have to tell you, I'm just getting into my swim. But I'll have to leave it there for this morning. But come back next time and find out, and find out what these teachers were saying and what they were ignoring. Because I think you'll find it extremely interesting and intriguing. And sadly, possibly not shocking. Because we're dulled down and we're stupefied by the culture around us, which is sucking Christian people in too. Father in heaven, we bow before you and we ask, O oh God, that what is good and comes from you, from your word, will find a place in our soul. If there's anything, O oh God, that is off man and unimportant or unhelpful because it is not the truth, then Lord, forgive us and remove it from our minds. God, help us not to be fooled and not to be confused by people who ridicule and scoff the very things that historic Christianity holds dear. And many, if not all of us, hold dear too. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.